I was just kind of praying in the car. I was like, you know, I'll sell as many houses as I can without having to hire people. And I just felt like in my spirit, you know, kind of the God's voice inside of me of like, that's just fear. Like you can't keep living your life afraid. I called Justin like that day or that week, real close out to and was like, hey, what do you think about doing this with me? From when we hired Justin, it was just a hockey stick. I don't know, 15, 20 houses a year to like 40 to 50 to 100, 200. I don't think there's anything more valuable than um, finding a, a mentor in whatever area of your life you need the most help in. I got up on a stage not long ago and I said, look, everybody in this room, if you did 30 open houses in 30 days, then I promise you, you'll have two escrows by the end of it. And none of you are gonna do this, 500 people in the room, right? And none of you are gonna do that. Sure enough, a guy did and got like five escrows. It's that tenacity and like figuring out the thing that you're gonna do and just being really consistent and being the guy at the dinner party who's writing Yelp reviews for himself on other people's phones. Like that's a little humiliating, it. but it paid off. All right, guys, welcome back to the Inspection Period, the brand new podcast series from Estate Media. As always, I'm your co-host, George. I'm Justin. And I'm Lindsay. And each and every week, we're bringing you our takes on the latest news, take, talking to guests and leadership across all kinds of industries, especially in real estate, discussing what we've learned along the way about ourselves, our world, and each other. And today, I've got like a really cool honor because John is a friend, a mentor, kind of feels like a brother to me. Uh, and we've gone back, we've done a lot of life together. I'll, I'll read like the official kind of bio and then I'll get into uh, the touchy feely stuff in a second. But uh, <laughs> official bio is John is the real estate pro and mastermind behind the Glutch Group uh, operating in Arizona and San Diego. And John's journey accidentally started in booming real estate market after graduating from Arizona University with a finance degree when his dad said, you can be anything besides a real estate agent or a banker. And here we are. So uh, he's flipped homes, bought rentals, co-founded a company even to teach others. And then the 2007 market crash came, uh, leaving John with a choice to either give up or rebuild. So he chose later transforming his life in Tacoma, Washington. I'll, I'll let John get into that in a little bit. And then eventually returning to Arizona to build the Glutch Group and find a really fantastic way to balance family life and real estate life, which we all know is so freaking hard to do. We've talked about that on the show a whole bunch. Um, and he now runs a, su a successful team from California, spending a ton of time with his family. I mean, heck, he's going on a six week vacation where he'll be completely unplugged in Europe here soon. The team will continue to do really cool stuff. And he really enjoys now is really passionate helping other agents find that same level of freedom and success in their careers. So honestly, John, Awesome to have you, man. Like, this is freaking cool. The background of this is that, yeah, John's daughter is my goddaughter. Uh, John took a risk on a idiot 19 year old way back in the day and said like, hey, I know you're like doing that elementary school fundraising thing. Ever thought about building a real estate company? And I said, no, but I'm getting married in a month and I actually just left that job. So I have no idea what I'm doing. Yet, so <laughs> let's give it a go. So like that month I went and got a real estate license instead of just taking the month off. And back then it was just me and John and our headies and board shorts high-fiving every time the phone rang and me sitting next to him. I have so much of my business acumen and my strategies and the way that I go about systemizing things because of getting to like sit next to John and learn from him all of this time. So this is like super special for me, man. Welcome, uh, thanks. John. Thank you. Very kind introduction. Thank you. I still, uh, my memory is funny. I don't remember a lot of stuff from the past for whatever reason. I just don't, but I still remember the lunch we had of like, Hey, do you want to be team member number one <laughs> of, uh, <laughs> of this new thing? And I had run companies before, but they had all failed miserably. So that wasn't uh, much of a resume to start with. But uh, you were willing to take a risk on me, and uh, man, it, it was uh, it meant a lot to me then, and uh, means even more to me now. So, so did excited. you like undersold yeah. it to a large degree? This yeah. to bring that back, you literally said like, "Hey, are you okay?" Like there'll be some times that like I might just be at the pool with my friends, you know, like and you might be here in the office working. <laughs> are you cool with that? And I was like, "Yeah, I, yeah, I guess so, as yeah. long as you just let me do my yeah. thing." So much of life is about setting expectations. So <laughs> luck. let me give you the worst case scenario here. So yeah, I'm really uh, honored to be here. It's been so fun to see you uh, thrive, Justin, and, and uh, grow in your career. And, and now what you're doing is just truly imp impressive. And uh, it's so fun. So fun to be here. Thanks for having me. 
just a freaking tech nerd now, man. That's all I am. Yeah, it's, sure. At least to George, anyways. That's all that I am. So, um, <laughs> awesome. Golf well, um, <laughs> what was that? I said a good golf partner too, man. Tech good nerding. golf partner. Yeah, we yeah. E- equally suck just as bad. Yes. So that's yeah. like helpful to have somebody in your misery in the midst of all of that for sure. Um, and uh, Lindsay, I know you and John don't really know each other that well, but I'm excited to like dive into that because uh, Lindsay handles all the touchy feely stuff on this podcast since um, I don't know, I'm still learning. But yeah, uh, my favorite not, part I, of I've like heard a couple of those uh, things that John does with his team. And I think it's, it's, it's like a client concierge or something like like that that is some gifting or a wow coordinator or something like oh, that. Oh, the wow coordinator. Yeah, yeah, I remember hearing that along the way. Back yeah. in the day, the coolest job in the company, getting to be Santa Claus with somebody else's money, basically. <laughs> so pretty, pretty cool. Uh, yeah, I, I'm excited to jump into this for like a myriad of reasons because John, like you're obviously like an incredible real estate strategist, but we know of a lot of team leaders and we know of a lot of real estate agents that like they do that at the neglect of everything else in their lives. Just absolute neglect. Everybody we got into, we've heard stories about people turning to alcohol, like marriages blowing up, all kinds of stuff. And you have found a way to like prioritize your family and what truly makes you happy and still build an incredible real estate career. And you didn't have to choose one or the other, which is what most people freaking think that you have to do. Right. But it's tricky and takes like a lot of dedication. And I don't know for everybody listening right now, my favorite word to describe John is intentional. He's like very methodical about the things that he does, even to the degree of, uh, I remember one of my favorite stories about, uh, this, this will, give you full full view John Glutch. He wanted to be present with his family more often, but you can't measure that very easily. So he created a Google form that he'd fill out every single night asking him questions like, how present were you with your wife? How present were you with your kids? Did you listen to what they said? And he, would create, he created a, a scoring mechanism so he could keep that front of mind because like that was his goal that year was to learn that skill set more. And that takes all kinds of freaking crazy intentionality. And people might say that feels robotic or whatever, but honestly, I think that it's awesome because what doesn't get measured doesn't grow in the first place. So, um, yeah, th- yeah that's, what I still do. that's, that's not wasn't still just one it? year. That's every day. Yeah. Not I'm every surprised day. we I mean, don't have Bryn I, doing it. I miss anymore. some days, but yeah, <laughs> I, the way I think and the way my wife think are very different. Uh, she is not, um, uh, the, like, let's measure this and fi- that's just not her MO. It's uh, unhelpful, <laughs> but for me, <laughs> It's really helpful, and uh, yeah, that I just, and it always changes. The, the questions change whenever I think of something new that I'm not doing well. You know, something that's important that I wouldn't naturally be good at. You know, um, I will put that in as one of the questions and and remove one of the ones that I've sort of gotten figured out. You know, so it's they're they're almost all about being an intentional and loving uh, father and intentional and loving husband and doing the things that just don't come naturally to me I, I wake up every day pretty good at running a company and pretty mediocre at being a dad and a, a husband and so i really really have to be intentional and thoughtful about it uh, otherwise it'll just you know it'll just fall to the wayside so you still do it yeah dude i love that i did it for a little bit and then Well, I fell off the wagon, so I guess you can go ask Faith how well I'm doing. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) You can't take my word for it. I'm a little biased, so. Yeah, you got it all figured out now. That's all good. Yeah. Yeah. So, so you actually, you give us- I'm just curious here. You actually have this is like, right up George's an, alley, by the way. I love this stuff, by <laughs> the way. Yeah, this is um, we're definitely synced on these types of things. Um, so it's a Google form that you fill out at the end of the day, essentially, and it has four or five questions that you just fill out as kind of a time to reflect on. Yeah, if you were intentional or. I got this from a book um, called. Uh, Gosh, I'll think of it. Um, it was a, it's about behavior change, and the idea is that once a day, the way he did it was he had a VA virtual assistant overseas who would call him and ask him these questions because he knew he would, you know, answer the phone and do it. He was paying her to do it, so he knew he would do it. And uh, the the magic of the question, or what what's important about the question, is on a scale of one to ten, did you do your best today to whatever. And that's an important way of asking the question because did you do your best is 
it triggers something in you of like, how hard did I try? Like, I may have been world class compared to whatever the average person, but did I do my best, you know, for the best that I could do in this particular arena of my life or this particular thing. And, um, yeah, I, I just created a Google form cause I didn't want to pay someone to do it for me. <laughs> so I just on my phone every night, there's a reminder to fill out that thing. And here, I'll give you a few. And so sometimes they're philosophical in nature or, um, you know, oftentimes they're specific activities or it's, it's behaviors, but mo most of the time it's mindsets. Um, so like right now it's, well, here's, I'll give you a few fall in love with the hard things and live an easy life. I read that the other day, not long ago as a quote, if you fall in love with hard things, you'll live an easy life. Like doing hard things, if, that, if you enjoy that, it makes your life <laughs> a lot easier, right? So I'm um, thinking, I wanna be constantly reminded of that mindset because it doesn't come naturally to me. So that question gets asked every night. Um, be a great friend to Bryn, think like an empty nester. So like, we've got, I don't know, eight years left of the kids being here at home and then what? <laughs> like if we don't have some kind of plan for how to be great friends, do fun activities together, live a life together. Like if we don't start now, it's not going to magically work. Like I have a good friend, an older mentor who told me like he, him and his wife really focused on this, but he had friends when, when their, their friend, his buddies retired and they're like, Oh great, sweetie. Now we get to spend a lot of time together. And she's like, I built another life. Like I got friends and I played this thing. I'm like, I wasn't waiting around for you to retire. So good luck, you know, yeah. so I don't want to do that. So as an example, um, ask thoughtful questions about people's feelings. I don't generally do that very well. So that's on my list. Uh, did I lose my life on a scale of one to 10? How, how hard did I try to lose my life? That's a scriptural thing for me, that something that Jesus talked about. Um, yeah, I'll just give you a few. Was I mindful of my intentions today? Like, did I focus on not just what I was doing, but the heart behind it? You know, we all know we can do things the, the right thing, the wrong way. So working on that, uh, listening with empathetic curiosity, avoiding interrupting. So this is all I love it. stuff that probably most women are very good at naturally, <laughs> but uh, type A guys, not so, not so great. So uh, I have to work on it. So yeah, I do that every night. Oh, you just had George take like an entire page of notes just now. Before yeah. I'll send you, I'll send you the link. Yeah. I love By the it. way, yeah, before I, love I jumped on, I was like, I know you and George don't know any, I was, I called John. I was like, I know you and George don't know each other very well, but you're like kindred souls for sure. There's a reason yeah. I get along with George so well too. It's like, yeah. uh, you guys are very similar in your, the way that your brains work. So. Yeah. Yeah. It, it definitely connected. I think it's interesting too, that um, you hear a lot of people talk about the morning routine, right? Like what does your morning look like? How are you setting your day up the right way? But I think you, I think there's not as much, thought put into the bookend, right? Like the very, the end of your day and how are you reflecting on what you accomplished and were you actually intentional and did you, did, and if not, what got in the way, right? And so, yep. um, and so how are you going to improve on that? So we don't probably do as much reflecting um, as I do like setting my day up for success, right? Yeah. So I think that's just a great, yeah. great call, man. What's interesting too is chat GPT, now that the voice recognition is so good, um, I've started pivoting to like, uh, throughout the day, like after my morning routine, after the routine with the kids in the morning, I'll just uh, one to 10, how did that go? And what would have made it a 10? I'll, I'll dictate that into chat GPT. And the idea is mostly to foster awareness. Like, Hey, how good did I do as a dad? I, I just had an hour with my kids that I'll never have again. How well did that go? Was I kind? Was I gentle? Was I, was I intentional? You know, so I just give myself one to 10, how did it go? And what would have made it a little bit better? And I just, a little self-reflection, 30 seconds, I just hit the thing and whatever. At some point it'll have enough data to give me some feedback, right? Of like, Hey, tell me what would I, what could I do to make my morning routine a little bit more thoughtful or intentional? Or what does it seem like I'm focusing on, but failing at, or what does it seem like I'm doing really well? So it's chat GPT has become such an interesting tool. I'll probably start doing the nightly routine into that as well. Just yeah. scoring those same questions, but dumping that into there um, because of its ability to give you real time feedback and, and over time feedback on where you may be doing better than other areas, what you need to focus on that kind of stuff. I haven't gotten that far yet right now. What it's doing is just helping me be more aware during the morning routine. I'm going to evaluate myself in an hour 
let me be a little more intentional, a little more focused, you know, and I do that for the work day, how, how effective my work day was, how my workout went, you know, just kind of the big blocks of the day. I, and I'm not perfect at it. I probably do it 60% of the time. You know? Yeah. No, I love Dude, that. You man. should uh, text me about that uh, later, by the way, because like it, it, that is like a interesting way to use chat GPT, but like I, I'll spin something up for you and like, three minutes to like actually properly store all of that data somewhere. So yeah, that'd, that'd be awesome. Yeah. yeah it won't, it won't take me long. So, and I, I'm aware and, and just for the benefit of the listeners, chat GPT is not private, right? So whatever you say into there, it, the world has access to, I don't know how that works, but I, I don't, I don't uh, reveal my deepest, deepest darkest secrets to uh, chat GPT. I will tell you our, our agreement with them has zero data retention. So there is that oh, part good. of things. So there yeah. you go. Yeah, well done. <laughs> So John, you are, uh, you're measuring a lot of different things and it sounds like there are a lot on the personal side of things. What was the impetus for that? Was there uh, marriage was falling apart? Life was falling apart. I was derailing. Like what was the catalyst for deciding to not only measure what you're doing at work, which is obviously incredible, but um, for taking that, what measures uh, what you can measure matters, um, and yeah. putting that into your personal life. Like what was the catalyst there? Uh, I mean, it's like everything is, is a bunch of stuff. Um, I'm very fortunate in that I, my wife is a very type A personality, very similar to me. And so she is not afraid to tell me, give me some feedback when things aren't going so hot. <laughs> so <laughs> I only um, laugh because I've been around for those feedback sessions. <laughs> yeah, we're both we're both very, you know, clear, direct communicators and, and that can cause friction, but it also is something I really cherish because at the end of the day, I mean, what are you know, like what's the point of this whole this whole experiment, you know, us being alive. And if we're if we're not growing, you know, growth is one of our core values at the, at the team, and certainly for me personally. So, to have that feedback is so so valuable. Um, my team is never going to tell me honestly how I'm doing, right? Because they, to some degree, work for me. So uh, even even agents have some level of that where they don't want to like piss off the boss, you know, or whatever. So, uh, but your spouse, especially your, your wife, if you're a man, will tell you what's really going on if you'll ask her. So that, that was helpful. I think I knew I needed to do better because the results weren't great. I'm like, ah, this is, you know, we're not having as much fun as I thought. Is it, marriage isn't as fun as I thought it would be. It wasn't, it's not as easy as I thought it would be. So um, I just kind of got a new frame around it of this is not supposed to be easy. This is supposed to be good and valuable and deep and, uh, process where we grow. So when I started looking at it that way of like, okay, how can this make me a better human being, a better husband, better father, then I really started to dive in. Um, I also took a leadership course that Darren Hardy, uh, he's one of my mentors and has become a friend. He has a course called the uh, hero's journey. And it's a year long leadership course that is world-class. It's not even close. It's by far the best leadership thing I've ever done. And it takes a year. It's all virtual. It's great. Um, and you know, one of his big principles of leadership is lead by example. And that just stuck with me of my kids. One of the things he talks about is evolutionarily, you can't, your kids are going to rebel against you because that's their job. They're, they're individuating, they're becoming their own human being, but they cannot help because it's built into our wiring mimicking you. So your example, especially as they become adolescents is more important than what you're saying. And we all kind of know that, right? Lead by example. But when I learned it as like, Hey, this is a trick to get my kids to do what I want them to do is to lead it instead of talking about it. It everything took a new level of seriousness to me of like, now I'll give you an example. I, I was, I, I, to me, a priority in my life is reading my Bible. You know, I don't have some real religious thing around that. I just think it's a valuable thing to do in your life, but I was doing it on my phone or my Kindle. My kids didn't know what I was doing on my phone. So I bought a Bible, like a leather bound <laughs> Bible, right? Which is less convenient, uh, not as helpful because I can't search and hide, whatever, right? But I, that's worth the sacrifice because they see me, they know what I'm doing. There's no question, right? They walk into the room, I'm reading the Bible, right? I'm not on Instagram, not on whatever. It's very clear to them. So I started to take very seriously leading by example and, um, it, eleva it just really elevated uh, my level of commitment to this kind of stuff in a big way. 
Yeah, I love that. I love the example of the physical Bible versus reading under Kindle, because I think, you know, I'm always looking at my phone when my husband's like, hello, did you hear what I said? And I'm like, yeah. I'm working. <laughs> right. right. Yes. But we totally. all know I'm scrolling Instagram. Let's be real. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Totally. You know, it's yeah. funny about that emulating thing. It's so freaking true. And hopefully you guys, I mean, we're only like 20 minutes into this thing. And hopefully John has already unpacked to you guys why I described him as intentional to people but um the even i was i remember it was like two years ago it was the first year that charlie woods like tiger brought his son to the pnc championship and uh charlie's son for those of you guys that are not golfers if you don't know who tiger woods is he's greatest golfer of all time but anyways his son's swing is exactly like his mm -hmm. like it, like it's a perfect replica and not just that their mannerisms how they pull clubs out of the bag what they do when they're walking up to the ball it's like literally they're twins and an announcer was like, Tiger, man, it must be so awesome to be teaching your kid like how to golf. And he laughed. He was like, you kidding me? He doesn't listen to a thing that I say. He doesn't. He doesn't. I might be Tiger Woods, but he does not care what I say. So like Tiger can't even convince his kid to do it. But the replication of his kid watching that over and over and over again is like so real that Charlie couldn't help but become it, you know. So. Yeah. And I think the, you know, I have a big team, we got, I don't, not compared to George, but compared to normal people, I got a big team. Um, compared to me with this team. <laughs> yeah. uh, and I, this is also true with your team that you lead by example, but nowhere near as important or powerful because the, those people are, the oven is, the cake is baked, you know, mm. changing behavior of a 30 year old or 40 year old is incredible, it's so hard. You know, the amount of people who can truly change their behavior at, at a deep level is it's so rare. So I, it's not that it's not important and it sets the culture, it sets the tone for sure. And I do stuff like, you know, I'll pop in a couple messages to Slack really early because I, I live, we're all remote and I live in California. I've got teams in Vegas and Phoenix. And so they got to, you know, I want them to see that I'm working hard. I don't think anyone on my team probably questions that, but part of that is because I'm showing them. Like they see me early, early morning working, whatever. But are, are most of them changing their behavior because of that? Eh, probably not. And they're just, they're, they're grownups, right? But your kids, man, that's a powerful opportunity you have if, you know, if you take it seriously to change who they are forever. You know, it's a pretty, pretty cool deal. I, I've become student more than interviewer here right now. I love this stuff, man. Um, uh, thank you for sharing it. Uh, honestly, I I think too, like as as kids, like in dealing with the kids and a business owner and a team leader in this, like um, I seem to get caught a lot in like what what I'm saying, right? Like, am I saying the right? You have I have so many intentional conversations every day that have to be thoughtful and how I'm communicating and how. Um, it's going to get them to be the best version of themselves, right? And and sometimes it's really freaking exhausting, man. Like I'm, you know, at the end of the day, you just want to have a real, like you just want to have a casual conversation. But you know, I'm also really trying to lean into those moments with my my two sons and and you know, Bisa give something impactful. But you gave me like you you took a weight off my shoulders a little bit, going like, you just have to model some stuff, yeah. like you what you're doing every day and day in and day out, and so two things are, I'm already taking away from this is the end of day form. And then I read on my phone a lot. Like that's where all my books are in my phone because it is convenient. It is helpful. Um, but they probably think I'm scrolling Instagram. <laughs> They're yeah. reading this book and that, you know, about growth and trying to be a better human. And so um, it might yeah. be better to grab that, that book just so they see that. Right. And they can, yeah. they can feel that. And, and, and it's a sacrifice. Like I said, with the, the Bible deal, it's like it is less convenient, more annoying, whatever. Mm -hmm. It just is. But it's worth it to me. I heard that the, this it's like a famous preacher uh, who sadly has, has kind of fallen apart uh, in recent years. But I still think uh, he had a lot of value in my life. And one of the things he, he said was um, for years he would quit for all of his kids you know, once they turned eight or nine in age where it started to matter, he quit work when they got off school and it was, it was, he was running a church. If anybody had a, a giant church, if anyone had an excuse to say, look, my work is important, you know, it really matters. He did. And he, he did that for like 10 years of like, no, I'm done when the kids are done. And I spend the afternoons with them. And he said it was an enormous sacrifice and, and I would never undo it. And, um, 
it was a good mental thing for me of like, yeah, that makes a lot of sense. And I have worked my schedule. It took me years to get here, but I've worked my schedule now to where when my kids are off for the most part, I'm off like this summer, I'm gone for six weeks. Cause that's how long their summer vacation is. So I will not get this summer again. And so I am focused on prioritizing them. And I get that that's a privilege. Uh, the, even the, the people on my team, we have very flexible schedules. They could take as much time off as they want, all that other stuff, but they still, most of them can't do what I'm doing. And I'm not unempathetic to that. I think that that in and of itself is valuable because you're showing your kids what the importance of providing for them and all that other stuff. I, I, like it, Everyone's journey is different, but in whatever way people can find, I think to cherish those years when your kids are home and when they want to be around you, which is a narrow window in the scope of life, right? Very narrow. Uh, that to me, there's just not much else that's more important than that. And I make a lot less money because of that. Um, you know, and that's okay. You know, it is what it is. We'll figure it out. <laughs> I like that you share that 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 comes out an income sacrifice too, because I think a lot of people out there are probably thinking, well, it must be nice. Yeah. Um, but kind of maybe if you wouldn't mind, um, because I don't know you and I'm guessing a lot of our listeners don't take us back. So I know that you were in a different industry before real estate and, uh, you had mentioned early on in this conversation that you'd had some failed businesses prior to real estate. So, uh, give us kind of a, like a clip notes on what that journey is and any key lessons or, you know, kind of pivotal transformations that happened during that time prior to, to getting into real estate and building what we know now as your team. Yeah, I started in 20, I got a finance degree in 2003. I was going to be a um, investment bank, banker is what I wanted to be, and, which is high paying corporate job. Um, and I had connections in that world and all kind of stuff and could not get a job. <laughs> I could not, like I, I had incredibly good grades, I had a great, great, all that. And I just couldn't get a job. I couldn't, I tried to get a bank teller job and they wouldn't hire me. Because they're like, dude, this, there's no way this guy's going to quit in a week. You know, it seems he find something better. <laughs> so I was just kind of lost and it was a good economy. I didn't even have a good excuse. But a friend of mine had started flipping houses and um, done very well. And he was a mentor, Young Life mentor. Young Life's a Christian ministry organization I was a part of. And he was a great guy named John Klinkhammer. And he um, said, hey, you can come work for me. I'm starting this company where we're going to teach people how to flip houses. And this was in the day when we would run radio ads for come to the hotel we're going to teach you how to flip houses. We give them a, a seminar and then we'd say, hey, if you want to be a part of our program, here's what, here's what you can do. This is all digital now, but this is what we did you know, in, at hotels. And uh, I learned how to flip, learned how to invest, learned how to be an entrepreneur uh, from John. I mean, he was just an incredible mentor, great, great human being, became a partner in that business. Uh, and it went well. I mean, we, we, we really were successful at helping people flip houses and buy rental portfolios and all that other stuff. It was really great. But then the economy... Uh, the real estate market crashed in 2007. So we had to lay everybody off. You know, I had to short sell six, seven houses, which was painful. The money that I had gotten to buy those homes, much of the seed money had come from my parents, from their savings. And so that was a downfall. So it's really a difficult, I was single at the time. Thank God, no kids. It's a good, if you're going to go broke, being single is a good time to do it. And uh, <laughs> I, you know, it was very humbling. And honestly put a lot of fear in me. And I just decided I'm never going to run a company again. This is uh, laying all these people off sucked, uh, taking all the risks sucks. You know, it just wasn't for me. Uh, went on a couple year long journey of, uh, I was still selling houses. So I basically, I had friends, this is when Obama was doing tax credits. You could get paid like seven grand to buy a house. So my friends were doing that and I, they were using me as their realtor. But I mean, I was making $40,000 a year or something, enough to get by, you know? And, um, figuring out what my life was about, you know, like what, th this didn't work. I wasn't fun even when I was making a lot of money. So, I mean, parts of it were fun. I don't want to, whatever, but it was also, <laughs> uh, didn't have a lot of depth or meaning to it. Right. Yeah. So I took a, you know, like about a year long, I don't know, pilgrimage, went up to Tacoma, Washington. They had a church up there that Justin and I got to be a part of their ministry where they help people put their lives back together. And it was incredible. Changed my life, helped me, uh, tremendously and um, met my wife there. And uh, we started dating not that long after that. We both met kind of at the bottom. <laughs> it's a good time to meet. And uh, so we both met Brent there. there. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So uh, yeah, so it was, and then started the, when I, I remember I was driving around one day, I came back home from Tacoma, was selling a few houses a year. And um, 
I was just kind of praying in the car. I was like, you know, I'll sell as many houses as I can without having to hire people. And I just felt like in my spirit, you know, kind of the God's voice inside of me of like, that's just fear. Like you can't keep living your life afraid. And I was like, ah, that's true. And so that's, I called Justin like that day or that week real close after that. And was like, Hey, what do you think about doing this with me? I just got so lucky to have him be the first person because he was uh, incredible what he did. And we, we started a coaching program at the time we joined Craig Proctor coaching. So it was kind of like all the, everything happened at once where the market was sort of turning. Justin was an incredible team member. Craig Proctor has a great system. Any system will work. It doesn't matter what system, just have a system. And it just was the perfect storm and it all just started taking off and we really started crushing it and selling, you know, from when we hired Justin, it was just a hockey stick of from, I don't know, 15, 20 houses a year to like 40 <laughs> to 50 to a hundred to 200, and, you know, on, on up from there. So that was, that's that a, was kind of the journey. I was telling George week. about the, 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 the years of uh, selling like 11 houses in a weekend when we would do that rotation yeah. system, <laughs> the entire company, you would just yeah. single-handedly take on the entire company at once over a weekend and then die the following two days. But you'd sell a lot of houses in that time by yourself. Yeah. So <laughs> yeah, we experimented with all kinds of models, but um, yeah, I think, you know what, I do a lot of coaching now and what worked for me was like the hockey stick was two things. One was just luck, like maybe a little bit of wisdom in there of like, I needed a realtor in Seattle to refer to someone to. And so I just Googled realtor in Seattle and Yelp at the time was the number one result that came up. Now Google takes all that traffic, but Yelp was the number one. And I got the number one guy in Yelp because I used Yelp to find restaurants. And I called him and said, hey, can you help? And he said, and he said, sure. And we'd like struck up a conversation. I said, how's it going, man? He said, I'm so busy. I'm turning down business. And I'm like, oh, what's that about? He said, I get so much business from Yelp. And Seattle is a tech hub is much way further ahead from than Phoenix. So their, their people are just more tech savvy. And I went, oh, that's something worth knowing about. And so we started really focusing on growing our Yelp presence, which we were way ahead of everybody. No mm -hmm. one was doing. And we still are the number one team in Yelp in Phoenix, like by a country mile. There's no one even close. So um, you can't Good fake luck, it. George. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> Yelp is Yelp is not. You can't game it. I mean, you, it just takes yeah. time. Like it's really one of those things you had to start early. So that won't work today. I can't. That's not a part of my coaching program because it won't work. And Google took a lot of that traffic, so we get way less Yelp business now. But as soon as I saw that happening, we got on top of Google. So, but that ship is you know, wobbling, who knows what AI is going to do to that. So part of like what works is, uh, worked for me won't necessarily work for other people, but I think that, which is important to know, right? Like I think in general, like you look at these people who are crushing it, their path is probably not yours. Um, what we really focus on to help people grow is open houses, which if you are very good at open house scripts and have a real system for that, that they are tried and true. They just work. They don't cost hardly any money. And they can get you now business faster than anything else I know how to do. Other than if you're really good at cold calling, like expires and physical, which most people are. So open houses are a little softer entry point. Uh, and then your sphere. That was the other thing I really did right. It was early on, I figured out we got to take really good care of these people that we've bought and sold houses with. And so we created really great programs to stay in touch with those people, not to forget about them. And, and that's really grown over time and been a huge part of our business too. I love it, man. I, I love um, how a lot of great business people sometimes chalk things up to luck, but I didn't hear anything in there that had to do with luck. It was like <laughs> this intentionality and, um, in foresight to see the opportunities in a market. Uh, and so, you know, identifying Yelp is a good pillar of your business early on. Uh, and this is something I coach to, to our agents is, you know, you got to know, you got to identify pillars of the business. It, it, you named, you know, Yelp and, um, open houses and obviously focusing on sphere and repeat referral business early. Um, it's so great to be able to identify that for like a newer agent, something for the audience to take away here, guys is like in every market, there's opportunities and there's transactions to be had. You have to figure out what that niche is for you and you got to test other ones, but there's some, you, if something's working, like, you went even more in on it, right? You figured out, okay, this Yelp market is, um, there's not many people actually cracking the code on this. And so it's this moment in time, it's identifying the opportunity and it's acting on the opportunity. And once something works, going in even more like all in on it. So um, 
something something for the viewer or the listeners to take away there for sure. So. Yeah, I think. I mean, I was. Brand likes to. My wife likes to joke about this. Like when I figured out Yelp mattered, I was literally at cocktail parties, taking people's phones and <laughs> logging into Yelp for them and writing the review for them. Like, hey, is that you happy with that? Does that look good? Send because <laughs> I figured out how it worked and like spent tons of time on it. I was tenacious. I was not. I was not going to give up till till it worked. That is probably the the actual lesson. You're right. Is yes. like figure out what it is that's working and crush it. I have there's a there's a guy I heard a podcast the other day. He's 20 years old, new to the business, and I got, I got up on a stage not long ago and I said, "Look, everybody in this room, if you did 30 open houses in 30 days, then I promise you you'll have two escrows by the end of it. And none of you are going to do this 500 people in the room, right? And none of you are going to do that." Sure enough, a guy did and got like five escrows out of it. <laughs> and that's all it's, it, it's really it. I mean, now can you do 30 open houses like a dummy and not get any deals done? Sure. But I was giving these people like a free course on how to be good at open houses, right? So I was like, follow the <laughs> script and do this for 30 days. And while you're at the open house and while no one is there, repeat the script train, like just listen to it over and over. Oh, Cause you can't just listen to it once and be good at the script, right? And this kid sure as heck did it. He's like 20 years old and did like five deals. It was incredible. Sent me pictures and he made it even better than I thought it would have been. It was really, really incredible. So it's that tenacity and like figuring out the thing that you're going to do and just being really consistent and, and being the guy at the dinner party who's writing Yelp reviews for himself on other people's phones. Like that's a little humiliating, but it paid off. <laughs> that's my takeaway here is I'm going to go steal everyone's phone and make yep. it write a Google review. But in all seriousness, my grandmother was a realtor for 40 years and um, she started her business with an open house and she could track almost every client she had over 40 years back to an open house. And I think what I hear is like, there's some tried and true strategies that just aren't going to change in real estate but you have to go at all in on them too. So yes, we can continue to look for the shiny silver bullet of what's gonna cure our, our production issues. But when it comes down to it, it's being a good person to the people who you worked with in the past and open houses. So when you kind of look forward though, I know you've mentioned a little bit about AI. Um, how are you leveraging that with your agents in terms of training? How are you telling them that they can um, leverage it to either maybe buy back some other time? Has that been a part of what you're coaching to now? Uh, it, yes, in, a, in, a, in maybe a way that you wouldn't expect. So Jeff Bezos, maybe you've heard this. They said, um, you know, what are, what are things going to be like in 10 years? And he said, I'm, I'm, not, yeah. I'm focused on what will, what will be the same and not what will be different in 10 years but what I know will still be true in 10 years. And I know that in 10 years, everyone's gonna want to have an easy and cheap way to have a package show up at their house the next day or the same day, right? How that's gonna be accomplished, I mean, gosh, we're just a wild guess. You know, I saw Apple's new Apple intelligence stuff that came out uh, this week and I was a little underwhelmed, honestly, but I think that they're all, I, I, what I got out of it was this is, this is going to be a giant leap. This world will be very different. Yeah. In a year. It's literally the future. Yeah. Certainly five years, it's not even going to be recognizable. What do I know for sure? I know for sure that people will still want to do business with people that they know and trust and got referred to by a friend. You know, that's not going to change. AI will never replace that ever. Is that the, your friend or your grandma or your best friend, like that referral is always going to be more valuable. So we are crazy focused on doubling down on our sphere repeat referral business right now. And there's, I don't know if you saw Kanye West's, this is the perfect example. Dean Jackson gave this to me. He's one of my coaches. <laughs> Kanye West did a Super Bowl commercial, spent whatever, however much the airtime for 30 seconds on the Super Bowl is millions and millions of dollars. And his commercial, you can Google it, is him holding up his phone, a dark selfie in like a car or something. And he said, I spent all my money on the commercial space. So I didn't have any money to make the commercial. So go to Yeezy.com and buy my stuff. And he turned off his phone. That was the commercial on the Super Bowl. And he sold $20 million worth of crappy clothes on a crappy website in one day. <laughs> Why? Why did that work? Because people love Kanye. It didn't matter. He could have been selling anything. The commercial was irrelevant. Not, the marketing not did anymore. not matter. Not sure if people love yeah, him no, anymore. Yeah. Who knows how that goes, right? <laughs> He's kind of yeah. blacklisted I know, now. <laughs> I, still, I still know plenty of Kanye fans out there. Yeah, so... <laughs> It's, it's the lesson is you, the people who love you will buy anything you sell. 
doesn't matter. You're, you're, you can charge whatever you need to charge. You don't need to do the dog and pony show, all this, right? But you, do, you just need a lot of people who love you, who think you're great. And that is only accomplished by thoughtful, consistent, meaningful connection with people. And, and you have to scale the unscalable. I mean, you just have to be willing to do the work. It, it, you can't, no automated drip campaign is going to do it. Like, it's just not, you, you just, you have to do the work of the client events and the personal emails and the phone call, like the Brian Buffini stuff that has been around forever. Um, yeah. I don't like his, per, his particular strategies are around that, but the philosophy is spot on. Like, I don't really want to go show up to people's houses with like ketchup for their 4th of July party. Like that's not gonna, that's not my style, you know, <laughs> but, uh, like his Popeye strategy isn't for me, but, um, we've taken the basic principle and just done it in a way that's a little more scalable and it's worked really, really well. So that's, to me, that's what AI won't change. Um, what we're doing to more directly answer the question, it's not moving the needle a ton in terms of our day-to-day -day work. I use it a lot, but my team, eh, some, you know, the average agent, maybe some, but it's not, it's not going to move the needle a ton right now. I don't think for most people, um, it's just kind of a fun time saver for a few different areas of your life. But, uh, it will, it, that's going to change. Yeah. That'll change for sure. Oh yeah. It's definitely changing. Uh, for sure. Like, <laughs> I mean, Google could be like the fact that you Google best realtor in Scottsdale and I'm number one, that matters a lot right now. Is that going to matter a lot in a year? Maybe, maybe not because people might go to chat GPT for that kind of thing. I don't know. I mean, I have my guesses on how that's going to go, but I am, Again, doubling down on sphere repeat referral, because if that leg gets kicked out from under me, which could happen tomorrow, then uh, you know, I better have a plan. Yeah, We've well, even seen it in the class. past with the Yelps, like even when Yelp was at its prime, right? Like Yelp changed from like non-area specific searches to area specific searches and it changed like the rankings. So now it wasn't just like all of the realtors together in one search and whoever had the most reviews showed up at the top. Now it was... Yeah where are you in the world and a yeah. different list gets displayed to you. So like you have no control over those lead sources yeah. at, at all. Yeah. The, yes. the other thing is homes.com. Uh, I heard a Mike Dalpretti uh, interview with their CEO, who's a smart guy. And um, they're, they're, the direction they went, if you check out their website, it's very obvious. They went hyper local. So we're going to focus on being creating neighborhood guides. This is what they did. Like, great photos, like legit info on what it's like to live in Arcadia versus Paradise Valley or whatever, right? They decided that they're going to aim long-term at being the great, great source for not only what are the neighborhoods like, but connecting you to an agent who knows that neighborhood well. So I think that's pretty smart too. I think being hyper-local and so doing open houses in a similar area over and over and over again, becoming famous. Craig Proctor used to say, you want to be Bigfoot splashing in a little puddle, right? You want to be a big fish in a small pond and doing tons of open houses in the same area with like a bright orange sign, which is what we have for, our, it's like, you can get known very quickly. You can take over a neighborhood very quickly, know about every listing, uh, tour every new listing that comes up, put a lot about social on social about that. So I think the agents who are very focused on, we're not really great at this, to be honest, but I think it's a great strategy. Being hyper local will, will definitely help people over time. Do you think well. that's like the future of it? It almost feels like farming to you because I, I do agree like the SEO. I, I have so many people at bar, like call me at bar agency trying to ask about SEO and like traffic to their website. And I'm like, you don't even have a blog. So you just can't compete because the reality is the way that you compete what people are searching for is not one, two, three Main Street. You, you can't outrank Zillow and Realtor.com and those websites yeah. that. it's impossible. What you could possibly outrank people on are what are the best places to hike in Arcadia, Arizona? Not Phoenix, mm -hmm. Arizona, not Scottsdale, Arizona, but this little suburb inside of Phoenix, Arizona, yep. that's like hyper local that somebody would actually be searching for. But that like combination of doing open houses as well as having a digital presence like that as well. Do you think that maybe that's the future of like farming as we knew it before, which was more physical postcards? Because it still takes the consistency that farming yeah. did. I, I, would, I would call it market making. So that's a big yeah. focus we have right now too, is we want to be ahead of the market. Clear cooperation might go away. If that goes away, that's really interesting because now we don't have an obligation as realtors to, and, and if you're, I'm at EXP, so we, we're allowed to pre-share our listings already. Any brokerage can do this. We just happen to be the biggest 
where we can share our listings with each other before they go live to market and, and still not violate clear, clear cooperation. So we're able to market to our clients. Hey, look at all these off market properties we have before they go to market. We'd love to connect you to one of these. And same thing with our buyers. We put all of our buyers into YLOPO. YLOPO allows you to create heat maps where if you plug in an address, YLOPO will tell you, hey, you got 30 buyers who want that house uh, or a house similar to that. So we're working really hard to market make, which gets a lot easier the smaller your target area is, right? Like it's really easy to mark. Like, you know, the guys who do a ton of luxury in Arcadia or PV or whatever, that's just their main focus. They, they're they doing a lot of off-market deals because they just know mm-hmm. who wants to sell and buy. That's easier to do in a small pool, but technology is allowing us to do that now more at scale with tools like YLOPO. And we use EXP exclusives, which is powered by Zenlist as our housing hub. And we've got hundreds, literally hundreds of houses that are for sale, but not on the MLS yet in there. So that that idea of like, let's plug buyers and sellers together before market, that also has a lot of viability and it, um, that is not, cannot be beaten by AI because AI doesn't know, it can try. Like I think these people over there are more prone to sell than others, but we've all signed up for those postcard programs and they suck. So to really know, like I actually know 30 people in the neighborhood who would sell if they could get X price or they're gonna sell in a year because their kids graduate, to really know that. And also really know the buyers who want to be in that area. That's, I don't know how AI could beat you, you know? So that's another great strategy that we're focusing on in a big way. I think the AI thing is interesting to me because obviously being the resident tech nerd here, we play in that land all the time. Um, and you're right, like this human to human interactions, all of that stuff. I, I actually don't see a reality where that gets solved with AI. I just see a world where service-based entities can scale to the likes of what tech companies were capable of scaling. And they were, SaaS companies were the only companies that could scale to these stratospheric heights because service-based companies are limited by humans and humans are hard and then you need more humans and your profit margins are less. And, uh, you know, George knows that from running a ginormous team, like the bigger the team gets, the worse those margins get, you know? So like the reality of that is that like, you know, things that I'm seeing built are going to be things like, yeah, let's instead of wasting a TC's time over the next three hours trying to track down vendors to get price quotes on stuff, maybe we could upload an inspection report and just get quotes back automatically, Mm -hmm. like from that, like that just saved a giant, a huge amount of time in the process, right? Uh, Let's provide better uh, insights into the way that our agents are having conversations with clients and create early flag warning detection systems and be able to grade and rate and give feedback on every single call and make sales managers and organizations and team leaders more effective in coaching their agents. Like we'll see that kind of stuff happen, but no, like I, it's so wise of you to focus in on, that's like one of my favorite Bezos quotes. I think he, he basically said, uh, you know what? I don't know what's going to change. I don't have a crystal ball, but I do know that people are not going to want their packages slower and for more money yeah, in the future. Yeah, so we're going to we're going to we're going to focus yeah. on that. It's yeah. what we're going to focus on. Perfect. Like the things yeah. that are like stagnant at all times is like that's at least a north star for you to hold on to. Yeah, yeah. It's um, I think it's an interesting thought experiment to really figure out. Okay, what is it that what's likely to get even like you think about um how texting has gotten marketers are in everything. Right. So now you're now even yeah. texting, you're always in scammers. You're worried. You're always worried about a scam. So that is, um, that is changing the landscape of how people think and interact with each other. Mm-hmm. Um, so that now even like people in our database who we have their number, they know theoretically who the glutch group is, but when we text them, we have to think about when we text them, making sure they know it's not a scam. Like, yeah. <laughs> because they don't know, like we haven't, they haven't you heard need from like us a in password a phrase is yeah. what you need. <laughs> and we're having to, unfortunately, we're having to build a bridge because we got, we fell off on this. We weren't doing the events as much. And we, we just kind of slacked really for a couple of years. So now that we got people, we sold a house to five years ago. I haven't talked to them in two years and we got to get to them without them feeling like it's a scam. And that's hard to scale. That, that means you gotta like pick up the phone and talk to this person and see how they're doing. And like, <laughs> it, but that's actually a huge advantage because mm-hmm. most people are not gonna do that. They're, they're not willing to put that time and energy in. And so if we will do it and build those bridges back, if like, hey, it's been, it's been a while, so sorry. Just, how you doing? How's the house? You know, super simple phone calls like that um, really 
are more meaningful in this environment than they were, you know, 10 years ago and, and more valuable as a company than they used to be. Yeah, I, I agree. I think that, the, the, you know, the AI presence in, in real estate, I think we're all kind of in agreement and a lot of the, um, top producers across the country that I talk to is like, there's always, the, there's just going to be a human element, um, to the transaction. I don't see that going away. I think what excites me most is, um, how can we make one create a better experience, which means like our agents and our team members and ourselves can spend more time in that relationship. Yeah. Um, doing exactly what gonna, John just talked about. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> what, what is, how do you have this AI assistant, this AI co-pilot that's going to help you do those things, right. To free up time. And I think that that's what, you know, the next couple of years, it's not going to be maybe sooner too. Um, you know, goal of, of ours is to create the most efficient and consistent agents on the planet um, so they can be in the relationships more and they can do the the human element, human contact. Uh, and so AI is going to be the, the answer to that, I believe, is where, you know, John, you were talking about your Google form and switching that now to chat GPT for your end of day dump, you know, like into how, what did I accomplish today? I see an agent doing that with their business, right? You don't have to go into follow a boss or uh, Boomtown or whatever platform you're using. You have an AI assistant you call and you download your day. Like, how did it go? Did you hear the seven prompts, 10 prompts that I want you to ask me? Like, did I get my handwritten thank yous done? George, uh, well, I didn't get my handwritten thank yous done. Can you bump those three people to tomorrow and remind me in the morning that I need to get that done? So, um, it's, it's, that's where I see it go, but like, man, I'm super, super geeked out and super excited about that. And this is going to be a really interesting time for all industries over the day. It, it's going to be unrecognizable in five years. So, um, super cool time to live for sure. I think one of my, the cool takeaways from this though, is like, I, I remember it was like, uh, what's that old saying? Like work works. Uh, you know, like if you, if you sit the open houses, you'll sell houses. If you pick up the phone and actually call your clients, you'll maintain relationships. But like, people just don't want to work is the reality most of the time, but like work, work works. And the, as I've come across solutions for business and life and almost never is the solution one where I go, Oh hell yeah, that's easy. I want to do that. Usually it's like <laughs> not sexy and seems like that's going to be annoying to do, but like it's the real answer to actually getting something done. But everybody else is looking for like a get rich quick scheme and it easy just does button. not exist. Yeah, yeah. It does not exist. Yeah, and it's it's this is related, but but not as well. But I want to make sure I say this. I think too that you have to start somewhere. Like I think you know I'm doing this. I'll be in Europe for six weeks this summer, right? That this is a decade in of me doing what you know, like a, a step at a time, right? Like it was first. It was like, can I take a day off? Because I was working seven days a week. I was in the delivery room when my daughter was born sending emails. So, look, I, I've been there and most people stay there, which is fine. Look, if you don't, if, if you're listening to this, you probably are wanting to grow, right? Most people who don't listen to podcasts have an ambition to grow. So, uh, start, just start, you know, like, too, like, I'm going to take Dan Sullivan uh, has some great material. If you just Google Dan Sullivan uh, Entrepreneurial Strategic Time coach. System. Yeah, he's the founder of Strategic Coach. I did Strategic Coach as a, a, a like a paying member for a couple of years. It was really great. I recommend it if you're if you're doing well. If you've got the money to pay for it, it's great. Worth a couple of years of your time. Um, but just Google his entrepreneurial time system. One of the things he focuses on is is take a real day off, twenty four hours where you don't think about work, you don't read any business books, you don't talk about work. You just take a day off, and you start with literally one day, and make it a day that's going to be you know as a realtor, it's probably not Saturday. You know, it's probably a Tuesday or Wednesday or something, right? And so just start with a day and then go to two days and then, you know, like, and you just sort of slowly progressively figure out a way to grow that if it's important to you, taking that time off, being with your kid, whatever it is. Right. Uh, and you can also do it. Not everyone's system has to be the same. I think there's also real value in um, carving out little pieces of time throughout the day. If you got to work on a Saturday, no problem. You can, it doesn't mean you can't have a great meaningful breakfast with the kids, right. Or a lunch break or a whatever. But I think what I found myself falling into the trap of is when I was, when I'm busy, when I'm working, it still happens to this day, when I'm busy and I'm working a lot, and I'm, I'm really focused. I decide I need some me time. 
and it's like I get home from the gym or the whatever, and I'm like, I just want to like watch F1 races on repeats, or I just want to like whatever veg out. I don't want to go play basketball in the backyard or do the you know see the draw with my daughter or whatever because that's that's more output than I feel like I have right now. And I've just tried to reshape all of that of like, well, what better me time could there possibly be than playing basketball, drawing, like, but that's not naturally in me. That takes work. And, and I, I just, that takes practice, you know, of like, I, I fail at that 70% of the time. So I'm, I'm working at work in progress on that, but I just want to, you know, encourage anybody listening to just to begin, to begin to take moments, to take hours, to take days, whatever that is, whether it's being consistent with open houses, being with your kids, taking a vacation, you know, start, just get started and let it grow and, and just progressively let that thing increase in your life. And it, uh, it, you'll be shocked where that will go over the scope of you know, a relatively short period of time, five, 10 years, you'd be shocked how, how, how far that'll take you. How do you feel like you got over the fear of doing that? Cause I feel like a lot of people I talked to, I mean, I got my business stress test strategy from you, John, the ability to, all right, like I'm in San Clemente right now away from the bar agency. I'm not, not working. There's stuff that I'm doing obviously, but like my presence being gone, uh, there are some things that I'm not doing while I'm gone, you know, and we'll see what breaks and I'll get back. And I've got my hit list of all the things I need to accomplish the next year. Like all that stuff that broke while I was gone for a month, I need to fix that and streamline that and strategize that. But honestly, it's, it's scary. Like I remember the first time that I did it and I said, I'm not going to do initial consults anymore, kickoff meetings, and I'm going to give that to somebody else, you know, and it's terrifying because you as the business owner feel like everything's going to freaking fall to pieces without you. And I don't, it's stupid ego things slash fear or whatever, but like, how, how do you feel like you got over that? Well, the fear is a messenger, right? That something is, you're, you've got a mindset wrong somewhere. So that's the most, the, it, I, I've learned that as I've gotten older. I didn't understand that at the time. But now when I get afraid, like, for example, going to Europe right this summer, that's expensive. Like the amount of money we're spending on this is no joke. And I, as I'm signing up for the whatevers and booking the things that, you know, there's a part of me that's like, man, this is a lot of money. Is this the right? Move? It's really fear at the end of the day. And what that's teaching me is um, I care too much about money because I'm valuing this money which look, we're not going to starve I, so far. Thank God, never missed a meal where it's, everything's going to be okay. But I am overvaluing this money and undervaluing the experience that we're going to have. And I'm going to spend some time journaling about that, reflecting on it, praying about it, talking to friends, because it's a great messenger of like, something's up in here that I don't want to be, my, my mindsets are different. A good tool that I use for that is uh, Byron Katie, B-Y-R-O-N, uh, Katie, she has this process called the work and it's a series of questions you have. If you go to her website, it's free. You can download the website, the workshop and her YouTube videos. Some of them are very fun to watch and funny, but it's basically a process of questioning your thinking similar to Dan Sullivan, but a little bit more kind of woo woo and spiritual, but it's, I think it's really valuable, but it's like, Hey, is that really true? That thought you have, is that really true? Do you know for sure that it's true? Well, what, what's the opposite of that thought? Like I got plenty of money and then vacation is going to be way more valuable than money. Is that possible that that thought is more true than the thought you just had a minute ago that was causing all the fear? So it's this whole process. I can't recommend it enough. Super, super valuable. Um, so I'll go through that process when I'm starting to be afraid uh, of stuff like that. Uh, and then obviously, uh, or, or um, not obviously, but honestly, try to work through the fear, try to figure out what's up. And then it'll come back again in six months from some new thing. And I'm like, okay, that thing's not quite dead yet. Let me work on that, <laughs> question my thinking and, and whatever. Um, and the, the other thing is you just kind of have to do it sometimes. Like if you're afraid to go do a CrossFit workout, you just need to go do a CrossFit workout and see how it goes. Uh, or if you're afraid to whatever, do an open house, you just got to go do one. Confidence can't, it can't be manufactured. It can only be earned. Like you just have to go do it and you get better at it over time. So it's got to force yourself to show up and make it happen. So all the, all the journaling and worksheets in the world sometimes won't work for me. I just have to go do it. And most of the time it's a combination of both. It's let me figure out what's going on inside of me. And then also go do the thing because while I do the thing, even more of the things are going to come up in my soul and I'll get to deal with those at that time and figure those out as well. Dude, that's awesome. I once heard a like pastor friend say that uh, courage comes before confidence. 
Like you got to have courage first before yeah. you you are entitled to any confidence because when you start, yeah. it's just one, two, three jump, and yeah. uh, you don't know how you're going to do it. And over time, you're right. You the more times you're courageous like that, the more times you learn. Oh man, I'm going to be okay. I've got the self confidence to make it through this. I got, and it's like such a good precursor. We were talking the other day about like. Uh, it's, uh, self-confidence being a precursor to success. Like it's just such a good thing to build in, in human beings. So yeah. freaking I'm, I, I'm glad we're recording this because I'm going to have chat GPT create like a life book for me out of this episode. <laughs> this is an incredibly <laughs> therapeutic episode for myself. Like I yeah. said, I became a student more than interviewer. In this, so I appreciate uh, that. John. Yeah, um, I, I love man, your self-awareness. It, it has this, it, obviously you're super intentional on this stuff. Have you always been aware or this mindful in things, or is this something that you've also recognized like, Hey man, I was just this chronic, you know, business workaholic and I needed to become more present. Yeah. Was there like an epiphany moment for you or, or no, it's like, like I've given, um, I don't know, four or five book references, you know, in this, uh, just ones that came to my mind. Right. So it's, it's just been a process of getting plugged into the right resources at various times. I think, you know, God has kind of led me down a fun path of learning along the way, but you know, like my first seven years of real estate, I sold on average seven houses. I'm the same guy fundamentally that I was then, but I found a system Craig Parker coaching that taught me, Oh, there are systems. But it was really first Brian Buffini. So it was Brian Buffini. Then I learned about who Zig Ziglar was. And then I learned about who Jim Rohn was from Brian Buffini. And then Craig Pro So once I learned there's a world where all these people have figured some of this stuff out, I just became like a savage about like learning and growing <laughs> and finding Darren Hardy talks about find your guru, find someone who you jive with and, and just dive deep into their stuff. And they'll point you to other resources as well along the way. So that's been a uh, really important part is just growing from other people. Um, you mentioned self-awareness and mindfulness. That's a big, big focus of mine now. And I think will probably be for the rest of my life is contemplative prayer, meditation, call it what you want, but just spending 20 minutes in the morning, recognizing that my thoughts are not me. I'm the person who is having the thoughts, but I'm not the thoughts themselves. I don't have to listen to them all the time. Oftentimes those thoughts are very unhelpful. Uh, so there's lots of different ways to get, get at that, but I love Eckhart Tolle. All his stuff is great. Uh, Michael Singer, the surrender experiment and the untethered soul are both must reads. Uh, my surrender experiment is one of the most fascinating books I've ever read. I've read it many times. Uh, Same. so those are great resources. And then, um, I really like Anthony DeMello, who's a Catholic, uh, Jesuit priest guy from India. And uh, he's dead now, but he wrote a book called Awareness. And all of his books are great about just being present and aware. So that whole rabbit hole has been very helpful. I love, yeah, you, so many books that I, I love as well. And everybody here nodding their heads. But Michael Singer's Surrender Experience was one that I would recommend highly. It was one that, like, what a, it was interesting to get, it, and I don't want to foreshadow too much, but a great book that you're like, can I listen to this guy? Um, that seems like a hippie out in the woods, but then you realize what he's done in his life and you're like, holy smokes, this, yes, this speaks to me. Right. Yeah. And so, um, I've been on that, that mindful journey for, for some time. I think, um, you know, there's these seasons of life and that's kind of what I, a lot of the things I've written down is you're, you're talking, it's, you know, it's been progressive. Um, you know, and I think it's a Simon Sinek quote. And this is what I see from like, um, younger agents in the business is we still got to set up this really good foundation of um, doing the hard things. Like, you know, what you're doing today, what Justin gets to do, go Sam Clemente and, you know, these experiences that we have, we're also set by the hard work we did early. Right. And if you want to be intentional about where your life is going, you've got to act in a certain way for a good number, for a, a long period of time. Like I get agents all the time that it's, I think we, and this is the Simon Sinek quote is it's not like, I think of it sometimes as entitlement, but it's, it's impatience. Like they seem to be impatient mm -hmm. of wanting to be a $200,000 producer or $400,000 producer or whatever it is. But I'm like, uh, my quote to them is always like, you know how long you have to act like a $400,000 producer before you're actually a $400,000 producer, right? You've got to do the hard things 
to get there. And then you can create some space in your business, taking away like, you know, Justin saying he's taking away those initial consultations, right? No longer doing open houses. I, you, you know, like I don't drive buyers around in the car anymore, right? Like there, mm-hmm. but all that came over time and being progressive with your business and deciding what was coming off your plate. So I, I love that, man. And that's like, I, the other thing I took away from you too, is that you spent a lot of time and energy being coached and diving and investing mm-hmm. into coaching. That is one of the most consistent things that I hear from great performers and top producers across the board is like, you're never, that, that's all. It seems like it's a, it's a line item in your P and L no matter what. Is that true? Like you're. Yeah. And I think too, the, the big thing, you know, I, I was in the, I went to my first chiropractor coaching thing and, um, I was doing like eight deals a year. I mean, I was, I was nobody. And, but I believed it. Like I, I talked to a bunch of people in there who were winning, they were doing the system and it was working. And I was like, I had faith. I was like, this is going to work and I'm going to do this. And I did it. Like I listened to every, I was on every webinar. I was on every call. I was in the car driving around, listening to them on repeat on the script calls. I mean, I dove in as far as you could possibly dive in. And two years later I was on stage doing hundreds of deals a year. There were how many, 450 other people in the room with me that day. Six of them were on stage with me two years later, right? What's the difference between us? Only that I had faith and I did the work. And I think many times agents, they're, they're working hard. They just don't, they're just not doing the system, right? They're doing it their own way. They're, they're not following your, as a team leader, your guidance. They're not using the script. They're not following the daily checklist. They're just not. I had a friend, a team leader posted that he was so frustrated because he's doing this contest with his agents and almost none of them are doing the activities that you need to win the contest. And he was super frustrated about it. And I've had that same experience and I've just stopped doing contests because it doesn't seem to me like they do much, like they really work very much. (laughs) And I don't think it's because the, the agents aren't working hard. In fact, I know that's not true. They're working really hard. I just think that many people have their own way of doing things and they for whatever reason, are just going to keep doing it. And I didn't, I knew what I was doing was failing. So it did not take much for me to go, all right, this guy, Craig, he's on stage and I'm not, I'm going to do what he's doing. And yeah, it worked. I think that faith and optimism, I sometimes say like you have to have delusional levels of optimism um, to really make it successful. But what I took from a lot of what you said is that faith and that belief because I think a lot of people do have that faulty programming that even if you're doing the actions, if they aren't, if they aren't coming from the right intent, if you truly don't believe that you are going to succeed and win clients and close deals from sitting open houses, you're probably not going to. Um, and it sounds like you've done a lot of work to rewire your inner beliefs. So your thoughts and your actions and ultimately your results are all aligned. Um, you've had a ton of great mentors and coaching programs that you've dropped. Obviously you do a lot of coaching and teaching. If you're kind of, you know, a consumer out there looking for where is like the best resource to get information, what what are you, where are you pointing people these days aside from obviously yourself, but where are you thinking the best resources? um, (laughs) Yeah. Johnglash.com. What are you talking about? I don't don't understand the question. (laughs) Yeah. J O H N G L U C H.com. There's no T. A lot of people put a T, although even if you misspell it, it'll get you the right place. Uh, yeah, it's, you know, I mean, what, what I've focused on in our, our coaching program and the, the coaching program is, uh, I don't know, a 10th of a percent of my, not, my income each year. It's a very small percentage of my income. The, the reason I have kept doing it is because it forces me to stay sharp because every Thursday I have to come up with something to say, and it needs to be worthy of the people who are spending money to be a part of my program. And so I've become a much better team leader because of the coaching program, because I have to dial in and sharpen and create the courses. And I have to be, my thinking has to be better to sell. It. So that's one of the reasons I keep doing it. It doesn't make any sense to keep doing it financially. Uh, but I do, you know, I, I think it's valuable and helpful. And I, my big focus is on open houses and sphere, helping people be good at those things, because I think they are AI proof and I think they are uh, scalable and I think they are free, you know, they're not, close to free. They don't cost much money. So you don't have to go buy leads. You don't have to outgun, uh, the George Lawton's of the world who can go buy, you know, whatever, whatever they need to buy for their team. Right. So, uh, that is the focus we've done on outside of what I'm doing. 
I mean, Brian Buffini has been saying the same thing on stage for 20 years and it still works, which is don't lose touch with your people. Um, mm -hmm. I think it's a great program. It's not my um, brand. Like the, de the, the mechanism for delivery is not exactly on, on brand with what we focus on, uh, but it works, no doubt about it. Um, I think anything works. Craig, what, I was happy with Craig Proctor. I got to a point where I, was, I felt like, I feel like mentors are oftentimes for a season. Um, mm -hmm. And it was a great season that was had a pretty clear ending. And so it was time to move on. Uh, I think Tom Ferry stuff's pretty legit. So I don't think it matters. I think you just got to yeah. pick something, pick, pick one, one thing. Yep. and freaking lean all the way in. And if, you, if you're on a team or if you're at a brokerage like, like mine, where we do a lot of uh, the brokerage itself and the, the people within the brokerage who recruit like me, we provide a lot of our resources, like my coaching, I give away for free to everyone who comes to our brokerage. Um, that Do that, right? Because it's free um, and just lean all the way in. So I think it's more important that you pick one and really lean in hard and actually do it than, than I don't know that any one is necessarily a lot better than that. Although if you don't want a cold call, don't hire Mike Fight Ferry's coaching program because that's, that's all about cold calling, right? So pick a horse you want to ride. <laughs> but, uh, you know, other than that, I, I don't know that it matters. Yeah. Uh, dude, you know, I still have like I, somewhere saved in the deep, dark corners of my iPhone and iTunes somewhere. I have those like recordings of all of our role play calls uh, back when we were doing the Craig Proctor, like live role, role play calls and stuff. And I don't I swear I've wiped this iPhone. I don't even know how it keeps getting back on, but I'll get in my car every now and again. And it'll just be a string of numbers dot wave file. And it will be a role play call with either you or I or you and I on one of those role play calls. <laughs> Yeah, but we, you're right, we dude. In. Like that universal yeah. callback callback script made me a ninja on the phone. Confident enough to where the other day I thought you challenged George to a recruiting contest out in Dallas. I was like, I haven't done this in a <laughs> while, in. but I, th I think <laughs> I think I can freaking kill it on the phone still because I got a lot of confidence in that skill set. Hundred percent, yeah. Just pick one and go all in. Absolutely, yeah. All right. John, man, I I think. Dude, we're going to have to have you back because there were so yeah. many other things I wanted to jump into with you, like your your team models and what you've tested over over time here. Um, super interesting to me, but, uh, you know, and kind of keep cognizant of the time here. I want to, this is kind of a wrap question. I'm curious, man, like if you were, be, go back in time, give your younger self a piece of advice if that was, you know, 25 uh, year old self. What would that advice be? What would that look like, man? I don't, I don't think there's anything more valuable than um, finding a, a mentor, whether it be a real life person, you know, uh, or a virtual mentor in whatever area of your life you need the most help in, you know, because there's times when all I'm reading are spiritual books. Like I'm not like right now, I don't, I'm not doing any real estate coaching. I'm not, I'm just, uh, that's not true. A little bit, but the vast majority is spiritual stuff right now. Cause that's, that's the game I currently need the most help playing. So pick, pick something, get some good advice from chat GPT or whoever, a friend or whatever, and find somebody who's got something to tell, to teach you that matter, matters to you and dive all the way in and just, you know, that you don't have to invent this stuff on your own. Uh, I figured that out way late in life. Um, I wish I would have figured it out sooner. Um, I'm going to add a bonus one, which would be uh, the five people you're surrounded by. It is true that you are becoming those people. Mm -hmm. they, there's no doubt about it. So uh, pick, go, go pick those people, be intentional, figure out who they are. And that would maybe even be the first piece of advice because those people are going to know about the mentors. <laughs> so, you know, they're going to have that, some of that figured out. So figure out four or five people whose lives you're like, dang, that's awesome. I want to be like them. Go find them and ask them what they're up to and they'll point you the right direction. Yeah, so I agree, man. So agree. Man. Well, this has been awesome, John. Thanks a ton for taking the time. Freaking hour and a half long podcast here. But like I think this is our longest one. And I, I feel like yeah. I feel like we could keep going for another hour yeah. and I'm not bored yet. Like I can keep I've got going. three pages of questions. <laughs> yes. uh, uh, George over there. Yeah. <laughs> if anybody was gonna get impatient first, like George would have been like it's, pacing around the room back there but like pages and pages <laughs> of notes man but i'm just so thankful for your wisdom like not just for me but your platform to be able to coach people and do all of that like uh it deserves to be heard because it's very 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 helpful for not just creating 
a, a thriving business, but also how to create a thriving life, which ultimately, like, why are we creating these businesses in the first place is to yeah. build the life that we wanted, you know? Yeah. So super thankful yeah. for that. Uh, kind of final plug, what's the best way for people to find you, follow you, get more information about you, all of that stuff? Yeah, yeah, johnglush.com, J-O-H-N. G L U C H dot com. And then I'm also Instagram handles the same. I post more on Instagram than probably any other place, but it's mostly real estate clips from stuff I'm speaking at and that kind of jazz. I don't do a ton of like personal posting because I just don't like it. But uh, so you'll, you can follow I'm my literally wife for the that. opposite. <laughs> I can't, I can't yeah. post anything business related, but I'll post about my kids and golf all yeah. day long. So yeah, if you want to see what my actual <laughs> life is like, my wife, her, that's a much more clear picture of what I'm actually doing. But uh, yeah, it's so that'd be a great, great place. And uh, yeah, a ton of free resources. I, I give away a ton of stuff for free. Uh, I would give away the coaching for free if I thought people would take it, uh, if I thought that would matter, but it mm -hmm. won't because <laughs> people value what they pay for. So uh, I, I, you know, the whole point of that is just to help, help people grow, grow their business. And there's a lot of uh, free stuff on there too. So. Right, Dude, well, awesome. That's thanks awesome. Well, here, thanks yeah. for being here, man. And uh, see everybody. Thank you so much for watching and or listening to this week's uh, episode of the inspection period. Make sure that you follow us on your podcast uh, platform of choice. Leave a review, five stars, you know, just the, the, the support. It helps in the rankings, but, you know, also helps me sleep at night to know that this is actually working. So and then uh, also don't forget to follow Estate Media on Instagram and Facebook and LinkedIn and on YouTube and all of the related places. They have so much incredible content, uh, real estate related uh, that you have heard of in your life, like Zillow Gone Wild or I don't know, uh, all of the Bravo stars, Josh Flagg, people like that, right? So if you want more content like that, make sure to, that you uh, follow Estate Media and we will be back next week with another episode. Thanks so much. Bye.